Well, criminalizing hate speech has once again come under the spotlight. The debate has been sparked by this latest Clicks hair advert. Now, a draft bill on the prevention and combating of hate crimes and hate speech is yet to be promulgated. But if passed into law, racism will be criminalized and carry a penalty of jail time or a fine. For now, the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act that allows for cases of hate speech to be heard by the Equality Court. Now, Jamila Omar is a senior lecturer in public law at the University of Cape Town, and she joins us now via video link in Cape Town. Jamila, thanks for your time this morning on the AM report. Criminalizing hate speech, is this the way we're going to change attitudes? Yeah, I think uh, this is a heavily debated issue about whether, whether we should criminalize. And in my view, um, I think it can be part of um, part of a way to change attitudes, but in and of itself is not going to do the trick. At the moment, how does a prosecutor or how would a prosecutor argue a case around hate speech? So at the moment, um, as you've already said, we have the um, Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act, and that is a process that runs through the equality courts. Mm -hmm. um, so that is not um, really dealt with by the National Prosecuting Authority because that would, um, that would include a kind of civil set of remedies. Um, and so uh, if the National Prosecuting Authority was involved, then it would mean that somebody laid a complaint at a police station of the common law offense of crimin injuria. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is a, a, a long-standing um, common law offence that we that we still have in South Africa um, that can capture certain types of. Um, it's actually meant to capture insults, mm -hmm. insults that are um, considered so um, serious, so as to constitute a crime. Um, and so, if somebody did lay such a claim, then that may be prosecuted. Um, and a criminal trial would unfold to decide whether the alleged perpetrator was, uh, can be convicted of, of the offense of crimin in urea. Yeah. So I suppose the question is, if we've got that common law statute of crimin in urea, why do we need hate speech to be included in this bill? All right, apologies for that. We seem to have lost our connection there to Jamila Omar, but let's see if we can try and re-establish that connection there. We're discussing criminalizing hate speech and whether it has an effect on changing attitudes, particularly in a country like South Africa. That picture was frozen. We'll try and get Jamila Omar back on the line and continue that uh, very important discussion. In the meantime, let's give you a sense now of the latest from the world of business. Here's a look at your market indicators this morning. Now, uh, the JSE tracked European counterparts for most of the day ahead of the European Central Bank policy meeting, which is scheduled for Thursday. The JSE all shares started the week in the green and gained 1.1% and ended the day at 54,400 points, with resources being one of the biggest winners of the day as well. Now, on the company's front, the top 40 was up 0.94%. ABI and Amplats were some of the best performing stocks of the day. Shares in consumer goods group ABI rose the most in more than five months after the group announced a 820 million rand final dividend payment. The rand broke its two-day winning streak, reaching an intraday low of 16 rand 76. The rand is still volatile among emerging currencies, though. Uh, we're seeing there 16.74 to the US dollar, uh, 19.77 to the euro, and 22.02 to the Great British Pound. Let's take a look at the commodities now. At market close, platinum miners rose by 3.85%. Gold lost 0.23%, while Brent crude had lost 0.26%. There's gold there at 1,925.56, uh, silver at 26.77, platinum there at 909.
and that's a look at your markets now. Let's continue our discussion around criminalizing hate speech, uh, which has once again come under the spotlight. Jamila Omar is a senior lecturer in public law at the University of Cape Town. We were in conversation with her earlier. Jamila, great to have you back on the line. Apologies for the technical gremlins there uh, in the system. But the question I was asking you before uh, uh, we lost our connection to you was the need for ha the hate speech part of the bill when we do have criminal urea. Yeah, I think um, so. So Historically, what happened with Bill is that um, hate, the hate crimes had been advocated for by many interest groups for a number of years, more than 10 years, actually. There had been um, a lot of research and advocacy around hate crimes. Um, and it was only at the last, in the last few months, actually, in the, in the very last iteration of the bill, that hate speech was, was added, in, added into the bill. And that was... I think as a result of a number of publicized incidents of racism um, that had taken place just before that. Um, and it, it seemed almost like the legislature felt the pressure to respond um, or yeah, the, the department um, felt a pressure to respond to those issues. Um, in my view, uh, you know, I think we need more thought about why we would need a standalone piece of legislation that deals with hate speech mm -hmm. when we've got women in urea and when we've got FAPUDA, the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair um, Discrimination Act. Um, it may be that there's a gap, and that has been one of the arguments, that FAPUDA has not been effective, and so we need something more than that, something with teeth, as they say, um, and, and that's a fair argument. But I think we need to spend more time thinking about what um, a piece of legislation yeah. like that would look like, what, what purpose it serves, and most importantly, how it's going to align itself with uh, freedom of expression in the Constitution and Papuda and Kriminin Yuria, so that the law doesn't look like a mix. Um, if we're going to have a new piece of legislation, what I would hope from it was that it would add more clarity rather than less. Yeah. Jamila, it's, it's understandable if we just take a look at some of the cases that have made headlines over the past years, just appalling cases of blatant racism and outright hatred for another human being. So it's understandable that victims of hate speech, victims of racism, they want restitution. I just, you know, we, we're continuing to question whether, are we criminalizing willy-nilly, for lack of a better term, in South Africa, when we do have so many other pressing issues as well, gender-based violence, uh, our murder rate, uh, and so on? Well, I think we are very quick to call for, um, for reforms that criminalize. I think that, uh, you know, I would say is very much embedded in the South African narrative. At the minute there's a problem, uh, you know, we say... Um, well, let's take away bail or parole or bring back the death penalty or criminalize racism. Um, and so I think that is always going to be part of our, um, of, of our conversation as a, as a country. And I think it's a useful one to have because, I mean, useful to have on the subject of criminalizing racism and other types of hate speech, because I think there is a sense that uh, people can get away with it. Um, and that that is obviously something that we would want to combat. My question would be, um, because you use the word restitution, um, and so you know that that becomes a very interesting issue to me because criminalizing doesn't create any kind of restitution. In fact, the bill, as it's drafted, the the only sentences that are um, that are prescribed in the bill are a fine or a period of imprisonment. Mm. Um, it doesn't allow for any other kind of restitutionary sentence, which the Criminal Procedure Act does for other types of offenses. So no community service, um, no uh, payment of money to an organization that deals with this kind of issue, no other type of actual restitution is possible through the bill. So what the bill at the moment does is really just criminalize and punish that individual mm. perpetrator. Now, I think that there's a place for that um, because we, there's no problem to send a strong message that this is unacceptable. And that's the role of criminal law to say, these are the rules by which our society must function. And if you don't follow them, 
um, then there are serious criminal consequences. But that's certainly not going to go far enough, in my view, um, as a preventative measure. A criminal sanction can only ever deal with an incident after it's happened. Yeah. Almost too late um, yeah. at that stage. Yeah. And, and one would argue as well, you talk about there not being any actual restitution. You could then argue there's no actual change in attitudes either, really. Yeah, I mean, look, my personal view is that um, we should be cautious about thinking that law can be used to quickly change attitudes. I think it's something that happens over time. So, for example... Um, you know, it, it took many years to uh, to write into the law, say, the abolition of marital rape. That should have happened much earlier, but it happened um, at a time almost when society was ready to catch up to that, um, as, you know, terrible as, as that prospect is. Um, so we can write different legislation at any point, but the law um, in its in its written form, can't force people to comply with yeah, it. Absolutely. And our immediate jump to, well, we'll enforce it through the police, um, I think raises other problems about the type of crime control society um, that we would be living in. Because I think many of the same people who would say we have to deal with racism very seriously, even through the criminal courts, would also say that giving too much power to the police um, and the criminal justice system, which, which can't cope with, with those numbers anyways, is also a bad thing. So I think it's a, a much more nuanced conversation about how criminalization fits into the overall picture of how we want to take this forward um, is necessary. What an interesting discussion. Thanks so much for your time this morning. Jamila Omar is a senior lecturer in public law at the University of Cape Town. She joins us there.